Hey John, can you help me understand modulation? Yeah, that's a great question. You see, modulation is... Well, it's... Well, you, when you think about it's... Um, hmm... What is modulation? Now, if you've hung around the modeling world long enough, you've probably seen some examples of modulation. It's that really highlighted style of painting a model that's got great contrast between shadow and highlight. And sometimes it looks a bit odd to the eye if you don't know what modulation is. So it's one of those things that I think, I know in my case, I've seen it, of course, and I've done it a few times, but when I actually try to nail down what is modulation, it took me a little bit of study to wrap my head around not only how do you do it, but why, when, and where. I first encountered the modulation style in modeling magazines many years ago, 10 or more years ago, and uh, it was intriguing and I, you know, liked the photos but it was more of a here's what I did kind of article than a really deep explanation of what it was. So I just thought, ah, it's something armor modelers do. And at the time I was an aircraft guy and well, I didn't need to do what those armor modelers do because I'm doing aircraft. But anyway, then not long after that, I ran into a, a DVD from a guy named Adam Wilder. And if you've not heard of Adam, he is a fabulous armor modeler, probably arguably one of the best in the world, if not the best. And I, I saw his work and I saw more of an explanation in that DVD that he did about what modulation was to explain uh, so, so that in a way that, you know, the average modeler could grasp. As time went by and I saw more of uh, models that were modulated, like I said, I got the how part. I saw what it was, but I didn't understand the the why and the where and the when. Those kind of questions that when I tend to overthink things that I like to answer so that I can really wrap my head around the whole process. So what I want to do in this video is not so much focus on the how. There's way better examples of that than I can ever do uh, in, in any reasonable amount of time out there on the net already. What I want to do is focus on when do you do it, why do you do it, and really getting at the core of what is it. Because I think when we understand that, then the how becomes much more productive and much more useful. Now, sometimes in figuring stuff out, it's helpful to define what a thing is not. So I want to start in kind of an odd place, I guess, but I want to talk about what modulation is not. First, modulation is not zenithal highlighting. If you've heard that term, if you've seen many painters, many miniature figure painters, not tiny little painters, but people who paint tiny little, you know what I mean. Anyway, zenithal highlighting is a, a technique that tries to simulate the effects that light has coming from above, from the, the zenith, the, the up high when the sun's up high. Um, and you've seen, like if you've watched any of Sarastro's videos, you know that he'll often prime a model with black and then do kind of an all-around spray of gray and then a highlight of white from above. And what that does is it lets him see if this model were being lit from above, where would the shadows be? Where would the midtones be? Where would the highlights be? So that's zenithal highlighting. Now, there are some aspects of zenithal highlighting that influence modulation, but the two, when you're really strictly defining the terms, are two separate things. Another thing that modulation is not is OSL, object source lighting. You may have seen this, again, with miniature painters, but not exclusively, that there will be uh, an attempt to say, uh, again, to use Serastro as an example, he did a figure of Luke Skywalker from Star Wars Legion. And Luke, of course, is holding his, his lightsaber, you know, and it's over here on this side of his, of his body. 
So when he painted the model, he made sure that the left side of the model was more in shadow and the right side had more light on it. And then he used various glazes and other things to simulate the glow of the lightsaber on this side of his body. So you saw kind of a bluish tint over here and down his the, a little bit on the right side and it was greater up here than it was down here. It was a really cool video and demonstrated the technique well, but it attempts to, to simulate a very close direct light source. I've seen other miniature painters do it where there's maybe a fire on the ground or something like that and they wanted to represent that. So that's OSL, but OSL and modulation aren't the same thing. Something else in the list of things that modulation is not is it's not a standalone technique. There have been many times that I've seen people looking at a picture of a modulated model before any other techniques were applied and they would say, oh, that looks horrible. I'd never do that on a model. Yeah, standing by itself, it does look kind of weird, but it's not intended to be a standalone technique. All right, now that I've spent a little bit of time talking about what modulation is not, let me talk a little bit about what it is. First, modulation helps the shapes and details on a model stand out. That's really its goal is when you're thinking about any kind of model, whether it's Gunpla, whether it's a Star Wars uh, space fighter, uh, maybe it's a tank, it can be an airplane, it can be anything. There are various shapes and details all over the model. And the modulation, what it tries to do is help those shapes stand out to the viewer. Another thing that modulation does is it can provide a map for later effects, for later weathering, for later uh, colors. It, it gives you a way of looking at the model from the very beginning and saying, where do I want there to be lighter weathering, darker weathering? Where do I want there to be shadow? What am I going to do later on? It's the underpinning for all of those things and helps those things stand out even more. It helps emphasize areas and de-emphasize others and deepen shadows and give weight to the model. Now I mentioned that modulation is not Zenithal highlighting and OSL, but it does draw from those techniques. It just sort of draws from them in an illogical way. While they try to represent light as it falls on a figure, whether it's from a distant source like the sun up above or from a lightsaber being held in a figure's hand. Modulation is using kind of the, 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 the spirit of OSL, the spirit of, of Zenithal highlighting, but in almost an inconsistent, illogical way when compared to the two of those. It, it uses those and flips them on its head to try and emphasize details in contrast to other details. So they're related, but they're different. Now, another thing about modulation is it's wide open to interpretation. You're going to see examples, uh, if you look out on the interwebs, of people who do modulation that have great contrast between the highlights and the shadows, or minimal contrast between the highlights and shadows. You're going to see it used in very subtle, small ways, and you're going to see it used in really big, dramatic ways. So there is no single right way to do modulation, ultimately. It's wide open to interpretation, and whatever you think is going to convey the message that you're trying to tell, the story you're trying to tell with the model you're building. Now to really start getting more at the core of how does this work? How does modulation work? Let's start off thinking about a full-size object. You know, picture in your mind a full-size tank or an airliner or a train, any large real object, big object that you can go outside and you can look at and you can see how the light falls on it and you can see the details you know, whatever it is you picture in your head when you think of a big object, that's, that's what we're going to use as kind of our basis for how it works. So I'm going to, I'm going to be describing it in terms of an airliner because generally we can all relate to that. 
even if you've never flown on a plane, you've seen one. So let's say it's sitting out on the tarmac and we're looking at it from a distance of, you know, two, three hundred feet away. It's a really large object, which means there's a lot of light bouncing off of that, bouncing back at our eyes, and thus we see it. Now that light is bouncing off of different facets, different shapes, different details on the actual airplane. And we see different distinctions. We see light in such a way that it indicates there's a curvature of the fuselage. We see it in another way that indicates that maybe the light source is on one side or the other of the vertical stabilizer. Maybe it's in shadow. Maybe it's much brighter because it's facing the sun. Then we see the, the wings and we see details on the wings and we may see undulations in the wings, uh, on the wing surface. So because of the size of the object, there's a lot of light hitting that object and it's bouncing back and hitting our eyes and giving our eyes a load of information that our brain is thus able to interpret to say, this is a really big thing and it's really heavy and there's a lot of little details going on there. Now, let's say we take a model of that same airliner, paint it up the same way, take it out in the same lighting conditions, set it on a table that looks like it has an, an airstrip on it, and then we get a scale distance away from it and look at it again. It's not going to look quite the same because it's much, much smaller. And it's not, it doesn't have as much surface for the light to hit, for as much shadow to be developed. And so we don't see it in the same way. Yeah, we get that this is a model of this thing, but what we don't get is a sense of the weight and the scale, and we lose clarity on a lot of the little details because they're just relatively so small and with so little light bouncing back from them, we just don't see it the same way. So modulation tries to add that back in so that as the eye looks at it, it's collecting information that simulates what natural lighting, what the look of a real object would be, but it tries to do it in kind of an unnatural way so that it sells to our brain the idea of realism. All right, let's take a look at a few poorly done graphics that I tried to do that might help further uh, illustrate this concept. Now to do a more detailed examination of what modulation is, I've come up with this graphic that's a really poorly designed piece of a model. Maybe it's the wing of a starship or the fender of a tank. It's just something that has a couple of shapes, a couple of facets, a single angle on it. Now to help identify the facets of this shape that I've come up with throughout this, this little demonstration here, I'm going to just, just letter them A, B, and C just for reference so that that we know which shape we're looking at. Now, if I flip this on its side and look at it directly from above, you can see we've got our three facets there. But aside from the little bit of shading I did where the B is, you, you wouldn't really see any detail. It all just looks flat. Now, I know this is a little abstract, but I think you get the point. Now, what modulation does is it takes your midtone, which would be about right here on each of these panels, and it adds in a gradient of highlight and a gradient of shadow that kind of blend it all together. And then where there is a change in angle, a change in shape, a change in the facet, then you go to the shadow color, the midtone, and the highlight. And you do this across the different panels. Now, this may be done freehand, this may be done with a brush, this may be done uh, being masked off and doing it with an airbrush. There's a lot of ways to get that gradient there, but that shows the basics of what a modulated look will do for uh, any piece, any facet of a model. And if I flip it back on its side and we look at it more from an isometric view, then you can see how this is going to help bring out the shapes of the model if you're looking at it. Now we can see, okay, there's a panel here, and then there's a transition, and then there's a, a shorter piece of material here, and then there's a longer one because the gradient is different, but all of it helps emphasize where the shapes of the model are. And then when you're trying to do uh, your weathering, this is an area that might normally be in shadow, 
And if you're putting weathering here, it's going to appear very dark and it can be lost. It can start looking murky by making some of these areas highlights. Now you've given a background that the weathering can show up better and it will look more even across the whole surface. Now, earlier I'd mentioned Adam Wilder and I was looking at Adam's Instagram uh, page, which there's a link down below for that if you want to take a look at it. And I highly recommend you, you do because um, he's got some, <laughs> man, he's got some great stuff. But I saw a couple of photos that he put up on his Instagram account of a model he's working on. And it's, it was in that early modulation stage. It's got the modulation applied, but it's not got any other effects on it. And I asked him, hey, can I use these photos in a video? Because I think they're far greater examples of looking at modulation from a critical standpoint to help us learn what it is than anything I could do. And he graciously said yes. So Adam, thank you very much for, uh, for letting me use these. Now here's an example of some of Adam Wilder's work that he kindly allowed me to use in this video. And you can see that in its unweathered raw form, modulation can look really weird, but it perfectly demonstrates how he uses uh, the, the, the highlights and the shadows to bring distinction between the various panels. Like look here along the back, there's a, 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 a highlight here and then down here in shadow, you have that. But then the door reverses that and you have the shadow up here and the highlight down here. So that what it does is it makes this, this area right here clearly distinct that there's a door and there's this thing here. And I can bet when he does the weathering, he's gonna apply some fairly heavy weathering down here because that's where people would get in and out. That's where things are gonna drip down towards. And that's where he's gonna have some very heavy weathering that that color is going to help that shine through. And then up here, there's going to be probably a lot of chipping and things like that. And you can see in other areas that sometimes it's not so much uh, driven by lighting, but just by distinction of panel. Notice the distinction here and here and along here, especially, you see a lot of different colors going on and they provide the basis for making sure that those areas stand out, even when a lot of weathering is applied. Now, another thing you may want to do in your quest for learning what is modulation is look up Adam's uh, YouTube channel. He did a series of videos on weathering a KV-1 tank. And in my opinion, it is the best work you're going to find on YouTube for a start to finish. How do you weather an armored model or just about any other kind of model? He shows lots of techniques, lots of product, lots of methods, and it's a great series. But in the first video of that series, he shows some pictures of his model in their modulated, in the modulated form before any weathering is done. If you watch the series, you see how it transforms so that by the time you get to the end, you're not looking at it and going, that's, that thing is over modulated. You're going, wow, I can see everything. It makes sense. So that's a great thing to look at when you're really trying to figure out how do I do this modulation thing now? Another way you can start applying modulation to your own work is just look for other examples. I see plenty of modelers who put up Gunpla and Armor models and uh, Machining Krieger and you name it, you name the genre, you're gonna find an example of modulation being used. Look at that modulation. Look at it how it's used. Don't just, you know, we tend to sometimes see photos and go, oh, that's cool. And then we move on to the next one. But sometimes it's worth it to save a photo and to blow it up on your screen and really look at it and look at how the modeler did it. The more you look at, the more data you're going to have to help you figure out how do I want to do this. Another thing you can do on the road to adding modulation to your work is to look at the model you're working with. Look at its shapes. Look at its details. Look at that and look at the examples and see how would I take what I see in the examples and apply it to my model. Are there particular areas that I want to highlight, particular details that I want to pop out? Are there things that I want to de-emphasize maybe? Modulation will help you do all of that. And by just taking your model and spending some time, especially when it's, when it's built and raw, maybe it's just primed, 
and looking at it from different angles, maybe even turning the lights out, getting the flashlight, and holding that flashlight up and moving it around the model. Yeah, that's Zenithal highlighting, but it can give you some ideas of how you want to take some of the data that you get into your brain from the Zenithal highlighting example and apply that to a modulated example. Another milestone on the road to modulation is picking your colors. When you look at examples that other modelers have done, look for examples that both show great contrast and minimal contrast, and maybe try out both of those. Because when you understand how much contrast you want to add through modulation, then it makes it easier to pick your colors. Because it's not always just a matter of picking, say, a green color and then adding white to it to make it lighter and black to it to make it darker. Because your green may be fairly vivid, and then when you add white and black to it, it's going to desaturate it in both directions, and maybe you don't want it desaturated. Maybe you want it to retain that vibrancy. So picking your colors to maintain whatever look that you want to look, that you want to have in that look, is going to be really important. And again, looking at other people's work can really help you find this. Also, many manufacturers make paint sets that have a full spectrum of modulation colors. That can be a real quick way to kickstart your modulation efforts because somebody who already knows how to do this has picked out a set of paints and said, here's these paints and they're going to help you do this. And you've just kind of got the colors mapped out right there in front of you. Now, another thing I'd advocate for very strongly is start subtle. That's what's helped me as I continue to learn and grow and apply modulation in my models is doing it in a subtle fashion. Doing it subtly kind of helps you figure out how does this work? Where do I put it? What's going to look right? How does doing it this way affect the final product after everything's been put on top of it? Now, there's also some benefit from saying, okay, I've done a couple of subtle models. Let me go big and see what that looks like and see the difference in the effect. The more you do it, the more you'll kind of dial in what level of modulation you like and it's going to work with the way you do your weathering and your later steps and is going to help the model look the way you want it to. Another way to, to make sure that modulation is doing what you want is when you get it applied, if you've used it to think about where am I going to be applying the weathering? How am I going to be applying the weathering? Where do I want it to be more intense or less intense? If you think of your modulation as mapping out the weathering, as I talked about earlier, it's really going to benefit you in the long run because the two of those have to shake hands because otherwise modulation becomes its own effect. And if it's not driving your weathering, then the two may seem disjointed and then it can get kind of cartoonish looking. Now, again, as with anything else in this hobby, that comes with experience. You may not nail it on your first attempt, but that's okay. What you've done, if you don't nail it on your first attempt, is you learned a way that you don't want to do it in the future, and that's good information to have. Now, to start wrapping up the video, keep some things in mind. Modulation is not a technique for everyone. As I talked about earlier, you may look at it and go, yeah, I just don't want to do that, and that's fine. But it's a technique that many people like and many people find helpful and it can be appreciated. There are techniques and styles that personally I don't really like doing, but when I look at them, I can appreciate them for what they are. I can, I can draw from those and get some ideas that helps me in the ways that I like to do things. Another thing to keep in mind is it's not a technique for every model. Not every model in every style is going to benefit from modulation. There may be some that, you know, because of its shape, its size, what you're trying to accomplish on the model itself, it may not work. So don't try and force it into every model you build. If it's not working out, maybe that model is not a great candidate for modulation. It's a tool like anything else to be applied in the right place at the right time for the right reasons. Another thing is it's a style. There are a lot of styles of modeling. There are things that range from impressionism to realism in uh, talking in art terms. And it's a style along that spectrum. 
it's probably closer to the Impressionism uh, style more than the Realism style, but because it's not the final effect, it often underpins the Realistic style. So keep in mind when you're working with it, it's just a style, and it's a style that can be really helpful in helping you convey your model story. And finally, like anything else, it's just going to take practice. It, it, there's, there's very few things we do in our hobby, especially these sort of, I guess you might call them higher-end techniques. Um, they're, they're not something that you generally get on your first attempt. Any technique, and modulation in particular, is going to take some practice. And the more you practice it, the more you'll learn to dial it in for your own tastes, your own results, and to get the look that you're going for. And finally, I want to emphasize this on everything I talk about. Modulation is fun. You're supposed to have fun with it. That's what the whole hobby is about. If you're trying modulation and it's just not fun in any way, shape, or form, and you've tried it and you've given it your best shot and you get done with it and you look at the results and you go, I don't like that and I don't think it's worth keeping on doing, then don't do it. It's about fun. If you're finding the discovery of this technique to be fun, then keep doing it. If you're not, like I always say, you're doing it wrong. Well, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it's been helpful in uh, helping you understand what modulation is, when to apply it, where to apply it, uh, how to apply it, and, and giving you uh, the information you need to move forward either on improving your own modulation or to start adding it to your models. I'd also like to thank Adam Wilder for letting me use uh, the, his photos and kind of refer to him a few times. And I'd also like to just thank him for his body of work over the years, which has inspired me in so many ways. He's a wonderful modeler. And if you've not checked out his work, please do, because I think anybody in any genre can learn something from his work and it's really going to improve the outcomes of your models. Well, you know the rest of all of this. You know, if, if you've not already subscribed, hit the button down over here and subscribe it. Hit the little bell icon. I'd appreciate it. I'm trying to grow the channel, and that really does help me. I'd also appreciate it if you give this video a like down below and maybe drop a comment and just tell me, you know, what you do with your own modulation or maybe if you have some questions uh, about it or some observations of things that, that maybe I didn't talk about that other people can read and can be helpful to them. So I would greatly appreciate any comments. There's also links down below to Patreon. If you would like to support the work I do, I would be most grateful if you would consider that. And if you're already a Patreon supporter, thank you so much for, for your support. It is a blessing to me and my family, and it makes what I do possible. And finally, with all that being said, I'd like to leave you with one final thought, as I always do. In this hobby, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Happy day to you, friends. Bye-bye.